Okay, uh, my name is Lana Malmsheimer, and I'm here with the LGBT History Project, and I'm in interviewing this morning Ted Martin. This is June 4th, 2013. Would you please state your full name? Sure. Uh, it's Ted Martin. <laughs> it's easy enough. Birth date and place? Uh, April 20th, 1965. I was born in Uniontown, Pennsylvania, which is in Fayette County in western Pennsylvania. I know. Parents' names? Uh, my mother's name was uh, Bernadine Woods, is her maiden name, uh, Martin, and my father's name is uh, Ted Martin as well. Okay. Did you have any siblings? I have one sister. Uh, her name is Lori. Mm -hmm. Is she older or younger? She's three years younger. Okay. Um, what were your parents' occupations? Uh, my father was a carpenter and a coal miner, actually, and my mother worked part-time at the Montgomery Ward's jewelry counter. Okay. Um, how long have you been living in Central PA? Well, I went to college here from 1983 to 1987, so I lived in Carlisle for four years. Then I left, and then I came back in 1995, and I've been here ever since. Okay. Um, where did you go to school? So I, I went to high school at Father Geibel Memorial High School, which is a Catholic high school in Connellsville, which is where I grew up. And then I went to Dickinson College. Which is where we met. Exactly. Stop. Um, is it okay now? I'm getting through a lot of this short stuff quickly. Sure. Um, how, ma how many years of schooling did you have total? Uh, I, had, I have a, a bachelor's degree, so four okay. years of college. Um, are you a member of a church? Not officially, no. Okay. Um, were you ever married? No. Do you have any children? No. Grandchildren? No. <laughs> Not likely. Um, what, what about your work history? What occupations have you worked through since you graduated from college? Sure. So my occupations have always, I, I've always worked for nonprofits. So I've, I've worked for, uh, uh, I've never worked for a for-profit anything. So my occupations have always been around government or public policy, and usually between some element of advocacy and communications is really the work that I've done the most of uh, since since college. Um, and you know, I think it's really been the communication skills that I've used the most that have that have kept me employed for the longest. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably been the centerpiece of my my work. I always seem to be advocating for something as well, too. So I always uh, had, I've always, I think it seems like I've always been most happy when I've been advocating for something or had a reason or there was something that drove my work. Um, could you name particular organizations that you've sure. worked for? Sure. So uh, after college, I worked for eight years for the U.S. Congress. I worked for the House of Representatives. I worked for the House Education and Labor Committee. And I started out as a Lyndon Baines Johnson intern at $1,000 a month, which was big money in 1987. And uh, I ended up as the deputy chief of staff when I left. I came back uh, from Washington to Carlisle. I worked for Dickinson College. Uh, I don't remember exactly how long, but I worked there for three years. I did public relations essentially for them. I ended up leaving there to go to Historic Harrisburg Association, where I was, which is the city's architectural preservation organization and I was the executive director uh, for three years. That's where I really learned to fight with city councils, I like to think, uh, and be a really, an advocate for sometimes things that aren't always popular. Uh, I left there to go to Team Pennsylvania Foundation, which is a private-public partnership that uh, does economic development. Um, it actually, um, it actually kind of advocates for business growth in Pennsylvania. It was a, sort of an interesting switch for me, and uh, I did that for three years. And then I went to the Department of Community and Economic Development. Uh, I was appointed by Governor Rendell, and I did marketing. So I marketed the state's business programs. Uh, I was the Executive Director of Economic Development Marketing was my title. And I was there for seven years, I think, seven years. Uh, and then I started this job three years ago, three years ago as of June 1st. And I've been the executive director of Equality Pennsylvania, which is the statewide LGBT advocacy organization since 2010. So uh, Equality Pennsylvania is the first uh, G GLBT advocacy organization you've worked for? It's my first professional gig as a professional homosexual, uh, yes, uh, okay. that it is. Okay. <laughs> that it is. Um, did you work before you went to college? 
Uh, my father was a carpenter, and so I used to do a lot of work with him. Um, I actually did a lot of work with him as this sort of uh, handy man, and hated it. Um, I did every, uh, I did everything, but um, it was not my my favorite thing to do. And I think my father knew that, uh, and I think that's why they encouraged me to go to college uh, and get out of Western Pennsylvania as quickly as I could. But um, I did do that, and then actually for. Three summers during college, I was a tour guide. So I stayed the summer and I did tour guide work and I did some office work at, at college as well um, in the Office of Student Services with Mary mm -hmm. Frances Carson and I uh, did a lot of that work. Did you have any involvement in college uh, with gay organizations? Well, I was a member of a fraternity, <laughs> which, <laughs> which technically is it. Uh, no, I did not. I mean, I really didn't. I was pretty closeted until I was 32. And okay. so. And, you know, it was a, just an odd time. I mean, it was the mid-80s. Um, it wasn't the end of the AIDS crisis or the HIV crisis, but it was sort of the beginning of the end or at least the height of it. Uh, I was deeply closeted. I was incredibly conflicted. Um, I certainly knew that I was gay. I certainly knew there were gay people around me. But it just wasn't a time. I think it just wasn't a time or a place where, you know, LGBT issues were talked about or advocated for. Was Dickinson a difficult place <coughs> at that time? No. Uh, you know, I had a wonderful time at Dickinson. I, I really, you know, I had a great four years. I think I enjoyed so much of it. It, it helped me to grow up. It helped me to be um, outgoing. It, it taught me how to work with many people. So, no, I mean, I don't, I, it wasn't a bad experience at all. I, I think if I look back, I guess at regrets, perhaps, you know, my regrets are, you know, that I didn't come out earlier, I guess. Um, but, you know, I, I think it's all worked out well for me, and, and my life, I guess, would have been very different. So, you know, there are the regrets that I hold about sort of not being out in my 20s, which, of course, is, the you know, that decade where you're supposedly the best looking, the most sexually active, and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, I think it is what it is. So um, it didn't really, I think that didn't all really happen until much later for me. Okay. Um, did you serve in the military? No. No. Memberships in any organizations, fraternal societies, professional organizations? You know, I was in a fraternity during college. Um, I've always been, uh, you know, I've always been involved in some type of uh, volunteer work. I've always been involved in some type of volunteer work. You know, when I was in Washington, I did volunteer work at a soup kitchen. Um, I've always been involved with, uh, you know, preservation organizations, architectural preservation organizations, some type of history organization. Mm -hmm. I've always been a board person. I mean, uh, you know, I was on we the... We should have you interviewing. <laughs> yeah. We should have you on the steering committee. <laughs> uh, I, like, I need more time. Like, I need more things to do. But, uh, no, I mean, I think I've always been, you know, I was on the board of Common Roads. I was on the board of the community center. So I've always been involved in some way. There's never been a time. It's, well, let's just put it this way. It's been rare in my life when there hasn't been some kind of volunteer activity taking okay. my time. Uh, when did you first realize, now we get going, sure. when did you first realize you were gay? You know, I think if I think, because people ask that all the time, it had to have been, I, I think I knew. I mean, I think I just knew I was different. I think I knew I was conflicted. I think I knew I was, there was something holding me back. Uh, you know, I was raised Catholic, which wasn't a bad experience either. I mean, it was all, you know, I had a wonderful experience, went to Catholic school, 12 years, and, and that was all wonderful. I, I think I just knew that there was always something that kept me back from being part of, you know, the larger fun that my, you know, my classmates were having. And, you know, so I would say I knew, oh boy, I must have known, you know, in, in junior high, somewhere right around in there, that there was something different, but I never would act on it. I sort of put it away and I really pushed it down and I really, uh, you know, kept it secret and kept it within my head. Did you feel that was necessary? I did feel it was necessary. Because I just didn't want it for a long time. I think I really wanted to, I denied it for a long time. I didn't want to be like that for a long time. I felt that I could, you know, I felt that I could some way, you know, lie my way through it or, or, or just act differently or, you know, I mean, I did date women for a while and I think, you know, I think it, it slowly built up in my head that, you know, I didn't want to lie. I mean, I think I really didn't want to lie. And so, I mean, now that I think about it, and I think at the time, 
you know, I've met people that were in relationships that were, were you know, that, that, the, that the, one of the partners was suddenly surprised, you know, when one of their partner came out. And I, I just didn't want to do that to somebody. I really just didn't want to do that to someone. It was in my head. I thought I couldn't, I couldn't do that to someone, you know, and, and sort of lie to them like that. And so I just really kept myself away from dating. I really sort of denied myself all of those things. And I got, you know, I wasn't an outcast. I was invited. I was social. Um, I just never, you know, I never had a date. I never brought anyone with me. There was never anyone around, um, and I just never acted on it. This may sound like it's obvious, but it's not historically. Why would you feel that way? You know, I think I had been brought up. I was, you know, Catholic. I think that, you know, that was always sort of a, a part in my head. I was always interested in politics, and gay people didn't get elected to politics. I mean, you know, uh, I, I was really unaware of Har Harvey Milk, who was really the only guy out there at the time. But, you know, gay people just didn't run for office. Gay people weren't public figures. Gay people weren't public figures of respect, I guess, you know, and I think that all played in my head. I guess I, I've always been a, an ambitious guy. I was an ambitious kid, and I had a plan of what was going to happen in my life, and, and being openly gay wasn't part of it. Um, when, did, when did you actually come out, and what was coming out? What? Well, you know, I always laugh because, uh, you know, I was in Washington, and Washington, D.C., for almost 10 years, Washington, D.C. is the gayest place short of Disney World. Uh, it, is just, it is just loaded with gay people, and I worked on Capitol Hill, which is probably the epicenter of gay in Washington. I mean, there's just gay people everywhere. And, uh, you know, I would, I, you know, and I knew, and I think I had, like, gaydar. I mean, you know, it was there, and, you know, the nascent gaydar. But I knew people were gay. I knew there were gay men around me. I knew there were lots of gay people and you know and so it was Washington DC in the 80s um, you know my my story I, I remember when I first went to Washington DC um, I had a job interview at the Brookings Institution which is right off of DuPont Circle you know the epicenter of gay and why you know along with Capitol Hill like the center of gay and so you know I went early because I, I had to I got a ride with someone and I and I got there early and so you know, I was, uh, had time to kill. It was July and it was really hot. And so I decided I'd take a walk. And so I took this walk uh, and strolling down the street, all excited in Washington. And, you know, I, I, walked into the, I walked into the DuPont Circle. Well, it really didn't strike me as odd that there were, you know, m I always say like more gay men there in an afternoon that like at, uh, you know, Nordstrom shoe sale. Uh, and so, you know, I went there all shirtless, but, you know, it was hot, so, you know, I never paid much attention. And so I walked in, and I had this really uncomfortable gray suit on that I bought in Carlisle, I remember, it, uh, you know, to, to interview, and it was this really uncomfortable, ill-fitting gray suit. And I, wa I was walking around, sweating and hot, and, and this guy said to me, hey, you in the gray suit. And I kind of turned around, because, you know, that's what you do. People talk to you respectfully. So I turned around, and he said, nice ass. And it so horrified me that I like ran. I just broke into this run um, out of the DuPont Circle. And I still remember, I can still hear it plainly in my head, this kind of uh, uh, cackle of laughter that only gay men can make. And it was just sort of this la went up behind me and I was mortified. I was just mortified. And I ran across the street and I ran almost right into sort of a vendor. And I asked, and, I, and he looked at me and I, I said like an orange soda. And, uh, and I bought this orange soda, and I opened it, and I went to drink it, and half of it went in my mouth, and half of it went down my lapel. Oh. And I literally sat down on the corner and cried. I was so, like, un just, like so unhappy with, like, the heat and the, the fact that this guy had just you know, really kind of outed me and, like, a disdain. I was just miserable. I was just incredibly miserable. I missed Dickinson. Um, actually, my mother had just passed away. It was just this awful time, and I just remember all that. And so for years, I refused to ever go to DuPont Circle. For years, I found reasons because, they, because I knew that they knew. And so I would go there, and I'd like force women to hold my hand, my friends, you know. And it just was so uncomfortable for me. And so I think that just chipped away. I mean, over time, it just finally chipped away. And so, you know, I lived in Washington all that time, never acted on it, uh, never acted on it. I came back to Carlisle in 1995 uh, to work at Dickinson. I, you know, I turned 30. 
I had been to all of my friends' weddings. I had been the fun, uh, you know, the fun usher at the weddings, and you know, the one they could, you know, that women could change in front of, and you know, like all that stuff. Like, you know, and it just reached a point where I was just miserably lonely. And every day I'd go to a lunch in the snack bar at Dickinson, and I would and I would sit with a group of people who are still friends of mine. But there was another group of people who it was a mixed table of young faculty, and there were gay people in that in that lunch and and they were having fun um, they were attractive they were young um, and they were going out on Saturday night which I wasn't and that made me really uncomfortable I met one of them he was really attractive I sort of fell for him um, and it really just drove me to the point where I just needed to act on it like I just I had reached a point like I couldn't I couldn't be alone anymore I couldn't I just couldn't um, not not do it. And so finally I uh, came out to him. Um, he was actually seeing someone else, but I had publicly admitted it and that kind of started the whole thing. And um, I have to say um, that it was 1997 and that that's that like it was in October uh, and that was like it was like the Fourth of July for um for like weeks. I mean, I had a great time telling people, and I finally came out, and it was just glorious. It was absolutely glorious, and so I think it was just I just drove myself. I was just that sort of inner controlled that I just sort of finally decided I just had had enough, and I couldn't be alone, and I I needed, you know, I didn't want to be seventy and suddenly say like God, I just wasted forty years of my life sort of wrestling with this, and that's what happened. And then did you find it some, some people to date? Yeah. I did. I did. You know, I found um, I found some people to date. I got connected and I started going that out. At Dickinson or elsewhere? Elsewhere. Uh, actually, sort of, I started going out with the people from Dickinson who were great. And they took me to places like Baltimore. And they took me to places like Harrisburg. And I found the clubs. And, you know, suddenly it was just fun. I mean, suddenly life just had something to do every weekend. And suddenly um, things were wonderful. And I have to say... Um, I made this whole plan because I'm a planner. So I made this whole plan after coming out of who I was going to tell. So all of my friends, you know, I, I was going to visit them and I go down this and this, you know, and I told this thing. And my Dickinson friends were most of the people that that I told first, and you know, my college friends. And so I remember I my my roommate John and his wife, who I'd helped introduce, um, lived in outside of Washington D.C. at the time. So you know, I made this call to them and I said, you know, I'm going to come down. I have something to tell you. And they're like, oh, come down for dinner on Sunday and. So I did, and so you know we had dinner, and they had uh, a daughter at the time, and one they have two now, but uh, she's a little she's a toddler, and they said, well they put her to bed, and then they sat down. They said like you know what's okay, what do, what do you have to tell us, you know, and so I so I sat down with this whole big series, and I, said, I really want to tell you, you know, I'm I'm gay, and John turned to Courtney and said, you win the bet, and so you know the bottom line is like I so remember that, and I was just like, are you kidding? And and you're like they were like we're just happy you're happy. We've known you're gay for like years now. Like we just are so glad you're finally admitting it. And then, you know, that opened up a whole world in Washington for me. That just opened so much. And so you know, it was just a glorious, glorious couple of months of just being. You know, being me. I mean, being being free and being able to go out and meet people and date people and see people and um, not worrying about, you know, being in places. Um, you know, and I lived in Washington, so I now had I left and I was sort of coming back. Um, my other favorite story about DC, and then I'll let you get back to your questions. But um, so one night I was with some people from Dickinson, and we went to, uh, to a, in DC, in DC, okay. um, at, at a bar. And, you know, they said, you, you, you know, they were a couple, and they said, you, you need to walk around, you need to meet people. So I was like, okay, fine. So, um, so I started walking around, and there's this big crowd of people at the bar ar around someone, and it was like, take your shirt off night and drink for free kind of thing. S not that I was taking my shirt off, but so I looked, and there's this, and this guy in the middle, and this guy in the middle of the whole thing was my former uh, uh, roommate from Washington. <laughs> And, and he had gone to Dickinson with me, and I, and I was like, God, where's the crowd? And he's like, what are you doing here? I said, same thing you're doing here. And so, like, we hung out that whole night. So, you know, he and I came out, like, you know, came out, and, and you know, that led to a lot of other things that he would invite me down, and we went out. But so we hung out that evening for a while, and then he had something to do. Um, and then my friends and I went to another bar, and so I was standing there, and they were like, go walk around. So I walked around, and I looked down at the end of the bar. Um, and there was another former housemate of mine from Washington, D.C. Um, so my joke the evening was if there was anyone that my friends wanted to meet, 
please point them out because the chances that they were a former um, housemate of mine were pretty good. So like that, like one evening, I met all these people, <laughs> and that was just it. I mean, I think that just gave me the confidence to really sort of be out and just be a part of it all. So you did travel to other cities to interact, inter interact with people there. Yes. Did you Did you come to Harrisburg at all, or did you think there was anything in Harrisburg? No, I came to Car I came to Harrisburg first. I mean, I absolutely came to Harrisburg first, and so you know, I went to the bars. I did. You know, I went to Stallions. I went to all the places that you're you know supposed to go, and uh, I joined all the clubs. I remember I joined. There was a camping group at the time. I think there was a book group at the time, because uh, you know I didn't want to meet anyone in a bar. I wanted to meet them like in sort of a you know highfalutin way. So um, you know I joined all those things, and that was good. So you know yeah, absolutely Harrisburg played a, a, a big role in that those first couple of those first couple of months for me of being out. Mm -hmm. um, what inter what impact did coming out have on your work life? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> you know, I was wearing a Dickinson at the time. And I had come from Washington, D.C., and, you know, I, was, I had come from a place that was very serious, uh, you know, a place where you wore suits, uh, where Congress people had heated arguments that impacted millions of people. And I came to Dickinson, and it was an odd adjustment for me. You know, I had gone there, and suddenly I worked there. And, went, and working there and being a student there are two very, very different things. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I had, I still wore the Washington, D.C. suits and all this sort of stuff. Now, I did a very public part of the, what the college does. I, I didn't interact with students. You taught, so I, I didn't do that. But when I wear the suits, it would scare students. I remember they get, like, really nervous about, like, who was I and, you know, why was I sort of walking around. So that sort of separated me from the place. So when I came out, I kind of softened my look a bit, I guess. You know, I sort of changed how I looked, got my ear pierced. And, you know, I was interacting with, I was interacting with um, donors. I was interacting with important people for the college. And I think, and I have no way of proving this, it caused a lot of uh, discomfort within the administration. It caused a lot of discomfort with the administration. People had a lot of questions about me. People suddenly, there was just talk, I could tell. And I honestly, and so my departure from Dickinson was not the best. Um, it wasn't it wasn't a termination or anything like that. But I left not in the best um, ways. I had applied for a job. Um, it went to someone else. And I honestly think that a little bit of homophobia played a role in that. And so, you know, unfortunately, you know, everyone, when I came out, everyone at Dickinson was fabulous. Everyone was fabulous, and I still have great friends that were, you know, and I'd known people from being a student there. It wasn't I'd been that gone that long, and they were terrific. But I think many of the newer people that I got to meet at the time, some of them were very, very uncomfortable uh, about me being out, about me being sort of, you know, and I wasn't vocal about it, but it just was. I was in a role where suddenly, you know, I was interacting with people uh, of of import. Were there, were there gay organizations on the campus at that point? You know, I think there were student organizations. I just wasn't, I wasn't, I didn't interact with them. I wasn't too familiar with them. Um, so I didn't seek that out. I didn't seek that out of the, you know, out of the, out of the school. I mean, I obviously knew there were, you know, uh, out people there. Um, but I, you know, and I, I become friends with some of the, the younger faculty that I talked about. But, um, uh, being a faculty member and being an administrator, as you know, are very different things. And so, uh, you know, and I think, you know, I think being out as a faculty member, you know, might be considered par for the course in a lot of ways. I mean, it's a certain element of, of academia. Uh, being an administrator is a different world. Were you still there when um, the um, health care argument went to the trustees? I believe that was before my time. I think that was actually before my time. That was with Ken Marvel. It would have been and about the same year. Probably, mid -80s. yeah, somewhere in and around there. But that was <laughs> after, yeah, that was after, yeah, it was, oh, I, I think it was after my, I was, it was between when I was a student and an employee, I think. Okay. I think that's, you know, when that happened. I never felt the place was not welcoming. I never felt the place, like, I never felt rejected. I never felt that there was, like, an active bias towards me. But I think there was some... I, this is just me. I have no way to prove this. I have no way to say that this is 
but I think there was a, you know, a little bit uh, there. There was something there, and it, it wasn't comfortable. So it, yes, it did impact my work environment. Um, and did it impact your family life? You know, no. <laughs> Remarkably so. You know, my, my mother had, my mother has been uh, deceased for a long time, so I never came out to her, unfortunately. But, you know, my sister was one of the first people I told, and my sister was terrific. She was like, great, I'm just, you know, I just want you to be happy. And so, you know, I slowly told, and that was, I have a very small family. Uh, my grandmother knew about it. My grandmother at the time was in her you know, mid to late 80s, and she was really good about it. So I was just saying, like, if my grandmother could accept it, like, everyone could accept it. Um, I was nervous about my father. I was really, really nervous about my father. And so I didn't tell him until last. And I didn't tell him until I had met someone. Um, and the person I met I knew was a special person. A person I met still was my husband, you know, 13 years, almost 14 years. And I think... Uh, I think once I had that, once I knew that I wanted someone in my life and that that person was going to, we were going to lead a life like everybody else, and I was going to extort every wedding gift uh, out of every person who had extorted one out of me over the past 20 years, I, you know, I knew, and that's when I had to tell, and that's when I felt like I had to tell my father. And my father was actually really good about it. Like, my father was really great. He noticed that I was happier. He noticed that I had changed. He noticed that I was better. Uh, and so he, he was, it was a remarkable, easy conversation. So yes, I think my family was very good about it. And Dwayne, my husband's family, was terrific about it. So you know, I, I think uh, I've been very lucky. I was very, very lucky. So then you were with Dwayne from then on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I have been. Um, how did it uh, impact this? There may be a little redundancy here, though, uh, social life. Well, you know, I think... I mean, you've talked about some about that. Yeah. Well, you know, I think I was finally happy. I think I was finally happy. And I knew that there was outlets. And I knew that there were things I could do. And I knew that, you know, there were places I could go. And that changed my world. That really, really changed my world. Because all of that stuff I've been de denying myself, all of it, for years, I could finally act on. So at 32, I was really like 17. Um, you know, with some experience. I mean, I wasn't stupid. But, you know, I think, I think it really made my life better. I mean, it's, it's made me. I mean, I remember, um, so, you know, when I was struggling to come out and all these things, I mean, I remember, uh, you know, Tales of the City was on, was on uh, American Playhouse on PBS. And I watched it, you know, quietly without telling anyone. But I loved every minute of it, you know, and I loved every minute of it. And there's this scene where uh, Michael writes a letter to his mother. Michael's the main character. And he talks about being gay as being the light of his life. And I think and that he would never go back in. And, and, and I just so firmly remember that making such an impression on me because it really is the center point of my life. Even when I wasn't a professional homosexual, it was always some element of my life. And so socially, it just, it's just what I do, you know, uh, and, it, and it is really sort of the centerpiece of so much of me. Mm -hmm. How about, uh, and you've talked a little about this, but how about civil and political life? Because they were very important to you. Well, that was a, you know, that was a real question, I think, in my head. You know, what, how would this impact so much of, of you know, my, my work? You know, after Dickinson, I took over, you know, I, I took over a preservation organization, arguably probably in the top five of uh, most gay heavy industries in the world. So, you know, once again, I think it was, you know, I went, and that, and that was great for, for me professionally, it was a good thing to do, but also socially because it interact, I got to interact with like a zillions of gay men. I mean, you know, like on the board and there were just lots of gay men. And so, you know, and, and, and not as much women, but, but that's when I really met a lot of gay men because they were very involved with the organization. So that was incredibly uh, um, helpful to me. Did you think about that when you decided to apply for this job? No, I really did So it was a surprise to you when you got it? It kind of was a surprise to me. I always laugh because uh, there's, a, there's a woman who's still one of my best friends. So this, that job came with all these women that became my mothers. Like, I've had this wonderful experience of life that everywhere I go, like, there seems to be someone who wants to mother me. I don't know if I have, like, a look, but it's great. And I've welcomed it, and I've learned to love it. And so there, were these, there was this woman... 
um, at Historic Harrisburg, who's still a very good friend. We still have over for Christmas Eve. Dwayne and I, you know, still take care of her the whole nine yards. And so she was a she was a widow, and um, like men would come in and talk to her, and like they'd talk to her, and she'd look at me, and I'd go. Like, I'm like, oh, Diane, no, that's just, you know, like, I just knew, and it was just so funny. I'm like, you know, you're just so in the wrong in this, you know, you need to volunteer. And she was a volunteer. I'm like, you need to volunteer, like, here's where you need to volunteer, like, for the Harrisburg Senators, or, you know, you need, like, something else, like, you know, for the, like, the, the like, the, the veteran, like, veterans organization. I was like, not here. And, you know, I think it was just a bit of a surprise to me. Um, and so, but how it impacted me beyond that, you know, um, so I was there till. So then I went to uh, I went to Team PA Foundation, which was a little bit different. Um, and the way I got involved really with the Rendell people was that um, you know he was running for governor. There were several people running for governor in 2002. He was the long shot at the time. Uh, and you know I felt he would be good for gay people. He was the former mayor of Philadelphia. He knew people. He had a long history of interactions with the community. And I thought, you know, he was in a tight race with then Bob Casey, if you remember. And I said, you know, who at the time wasn't so great for our issues, uh, as were the other candidates. And I said, you know, if you want, if you Mayor Rendell want to get ahead in a small and in, in a narrow race, you need to come to Central Pennsylvania and meet the gay community, who could give you the edge. And some people from Philadelphia had made that connection for me. And so I invited him here. And, and I and took him to uh, Business Association of Gays and Lesbians. I was the co-chair. That's the forerunner of the today's chamber. Um, I took him to those meetings. I took him to pride festivals. Um, I took him to these events. And that, then he was just you know, the former mayor. And that's how I got involved. So I was valued for my gay connections at that time. I mean, they wanted, you know, he wanted that interaction with the community. And the great part about it was here was a guy who was running for governor who didn't care about the fact that he was being photographed with gay people. When, you know, other candidates in 2002, quite honestly, referred to uh, the LGBT community as those people in print. And so, you know, Ed Rendell was like, well, I don't care. You know, and I remember, so I, I got him to come and speak at um, the Fall Achievement Benefit back in 2002. Was, I think it was the end of 2001, and he said, he stood up, and after we'd worked the crowd, and he said, you know, a lot of people had controversy, or there was a lot of controversy about me coming here. People said, you know, why would you come? And he said, you know, I'm looking around the room at 600 well-dressed people who vote with a lot of disposable income. Why wouldn't I be here? And that was the end. I mean, that was it. I mean, that was the defining moment. And, and from then on out, you know, uh, you know, I remember looking at him, and I said, you know, you know, Mayor, because he's former mayor, you know, as like mayor, you know, I think you're used to those kind of, um, so you're used to those sort of uh, uh, mouthy, uh, uh, tightly, tightly wound Philly gays. And I said, we're not going to ask you any hard questions. We're just happy you're here. And and you know, and I think he remembered that. And I think in that sense, and so he started involving me in his campaign. I started sitting down with all kinds of different people. You know, business people that were making up the bulk of his campaign. I was raising money for him. So, in, in essence, I mean, the gay part helped me a lot. I mean, it helped me to break into politics and make in, in a much bigger way. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, he was he, uh, he appointed a lot of uh, LGBT folks to his administration. And so, you know, in that sense, it was actually something that that worked in my favor. Uh, that's something that absolutely helped. And when he was governor, I would still bring him to pride festivals. We'd walk in parades, uh, you know. And you know, my job was different, but he would call on me. I mean, I get calls in my office from him, which are always terrifying. Believe me. Um, and they say, like, you know, please hold for the governor. And he would, <clears throat> you know, and we would talk about things. And he, you know, and I helped him with those issues. And not that he needed help, but like, sort of maybe navigated. So it was actually a very good thing. I mean, it was actually really, really a good thing. And that's what took thing. you into the Rendell uh, administration. Correct. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And that's how I got in, so. Mm -hmm. um, how about your spiritual life? That's kind of a bad thing. I think that's kind of a, uh, uh, not a bad thing, but you know, um, the more political I've become and the more involved I've become in, in sort of the, the LGBT world, uh, the more I think hard spirituality has become for me. Not that I don't, as I like to say, I don't, I don't have a problem with God. I'm, I'm not too thrilled with his employees. And I think that, in a large way, seems to be my take on it. You know, I was raised Catholic. And once again, not a bad experience. I had a wonderful experience um, in high school and grade school. The nuns took care of me once again, you know, mothering me. You know, I, I was an altar boy for years. Um, 
and, and even after I met Dwayne, I mean, we would still go to Mass. I mean, Dwayne and I used to go to Mass all the time, uh, you know, and so I mean, on a regular basis. I was raised much more of a Catholic than he was, but we would go to Mass, and I just reached a point where I couldn't take it anymore, and I started to act out during services. Like, I couldn't, I just couldn't listen to it anymore. And, you know, I, you know every time, like, the priest would start some sort of sermon, you know, I would... I, I used to remember right, this worst, it was like the, the loudest stage sigh. Every time he'd start, I'd go, <sighs> you know, and like 40 people would turn around and look. And like Dwayne would like look at me like, shut up. <laughs> or I would say things like, here we go again, in that tone. And, you know, people, and it, it just reached a point that I couldn't, you know, I just simply couldn't take it anymore. And I think the breaking point was the 2002 election. Uh, you know, uh, after Mass on Sunday, Dwayne and I had spent, we spent, you know, weeks every week on Saturday evenings and Friday evenings at the bars and giving out information on Governor Rendell, like we do all this sort of stuff. And so I was exhausted. It was the last weekend before the election. Dwayne and I had been at the bars. And so we came in and I used to wear my Rendell button to Mass and I'd go to communion like this, you know, and I just would do it because I knew it would get a reaction. Like, this is me. And so I was out there, you know, and the priest said, your, your Catholic voter guide will be available after services. And I was just like, okay. So, um, and I said to Dwayne, I'm like, here we go. So I walked out and, you know, in this, you know, the crowd, and this, this little old lady comes up to me and, you know, she hands me. And I said, what's this? She says, your Catholic voter guide. And so I, as I was looking at it, she leaned in and she looked at my button and she said in a very low voice, you know, you can't be a good Catholic and, uh, and pro-choice. And I said to her, I said, I'm sorry, pardon me? And she looked at me and she repeated it again. And I said, you know what? You know what I can be? A good American, which trains me to use my brain and separate church from state. Now, I would suggest you get your empty old head out of my way before I knock it into next week. And the blood drained out of her face and she stepped back and I crumpled it up and I threw it away. And I walked away and I remember Dwayne said, do you feel better? And I said, I feel great. <laughs> I feel great. But that was it. I mean, I think that was it. And, you know, in this job that I do, um, you know, people of faith, or at least their leadership, let's put it that way, their leadership do some awfully nasty things, some really mean, horrible things. Do you have some uh, examples? Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, the, the Catholic Conference spends uh, over, has five lobbyists um, in the legislature. One's a nun. They spend over a million, probably a million and a half dollars per year to lobby against everything, everything. They take LGBT protections out of bullying bills. They stop everything. They work on everything behind the scenes. And they threaten legislators with things that would make the Borgias smile. Things like, we won't give you communion. We won't give your child first holy communion if you your child if we won't give this is the kind of this shit actually happens in the 21st century right down the street that kind of stuff um, you know any discussion of even remotely LGBT related things sends them into overdrive and it's not only the Catholics it's the evangelicals as well that's horrifying to me and I know I know that people who go to mass for example, or go to services, who put money in the collection basket, you cannot tell me that that money isn't going to support this. You know, that kind of activity. And, you know, and polling overwhelmingly shows the people in the pews don't agree with the people spewing this hate. And so, quite honestly, for me, it's really hard. Um, it is really hard. Personally, separating from the Catholic Church was really a painful experience for me really a painful experience for me. They had been my parents. They had been you know, such a part of my life. To really separate that out um, was awful. I still keep my altar boy manual on my desk. It's back there. You know, just, you know, I just have it. It was an awful thing. Um, this job, unfortunately, and, and maybe being gay in a lot of ways has made me, but I think really the job more than anything else, has made me a little bit of the anti-religion guy. Um, because I said, you know, I know how it's used, and I know, uh, I, and I, I just simply cannot believe any deity would kind of sign off on this one. I mean, what did you think of dignity? So here's the thing, you know, I think of dignity, and I think of like there are a lot of other faiths, and I'm not saying I don't want to paint faiths with a broad brush because 
you know, I don't like us, I don't like being painted with a broad brush, I don't want the gay community painted with, you know, there, there are lots of, and so there are a lot of uh, uh, denominations working on the issue, have accepted the issue, I mean, there are a lot of good people, so I, I don't want to paint, I mean, I guess it's just, I, I look at the bad guys. Um, I just simply feel that my faith was stolen from me, and so it was hard for me to even adjust to something else, like I went to Episcopal services, I knew I was welcome, I knew about dignity, I knew there was all these other outlets, but it's just hard for me, like I can't, it's, it's as Catholics say, it's the smells and the bells, I mean it's the stuff that you're used to, it's just, was, it's just really hard for me to suddenly say like, okay I'm not that, but I'm this, and it's just tough, I mean I just have a hard time, and I know a lot of other people like this, it's a hard time reconciling that, so it's still a pretty raw issue for me, I think it's a really raw issue for me, um, and I have to be very careful in talking about faith uh, um, when I do my work. Mm -hmm. I certainly don't shy away from talking about my personal side of you know, my, my journey with faith. Uh, and like I said, I know there are lots of wonderful people out there, the MCCs, I and mean, they're wonderful people, but for me it's just a hard, it's a hard lift. It's a really hard lift. And like I said, I, you know, thank God, thank God that, that many people don't have to face these folks all the time um, in the legislature. Uh, but they need to know that all of those folks of faith are knifing them in the back repeatedly um, when it comes to getting anything done for for you know equality. Uh, Speak a little more about that. Well, like I said, I mean, you know, the, uh, the 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 evangelicals and the Catholic Conference are incredibly powerful. I mean, they are incredibly powerful. I would say they are probably on par as powerful in the legislature as the NRA, which is saying a lot which is really saying a lot. Uh, and they quietly uh, and very um, stealthily go behind the back. And, you know, so I'll give you a perfect example. So, you know, there was some uh, bullying legislation, House Bill 156, the PASS Act, great piece of legislation. It would mandate a number of things, but it would allow uh, it, would, it would ask schools to have programs on LGBT education, to, LG, you know, to train students about LGBT students. And we all know, there is no denial, there is absolutely no denying the fact that bullying, the, the students that are bullied predominantly are gay, it's just, or LGBT, there's just no denying that. And so training, and I also firmly believe, you know, it, you have to be carefully taught, as the musical says, you know, students learn this kind of stuff. So if, if there was training, maybe it would stop. House Bill 156 asked for LGBT training. The opponents of that, the Catholics and the Evangelicals, went behind quietly and had that all removed. I don't care how you slice it, but you have blood on your hands. I don't care how you slice it. Because of that, kids kill themselves. Period. So you can go to church all you want. You can have communion all you want. You can pray around the clock. But if you are actually preventing laws that talk about training and equality and treating people decently, which, by the way, is really all that Christ ever said, I mean, you know, period, if that's your deity. I mean, I think all he really ever, I mean, remember, I always like to say, he actually got in trouble because he kind of um, hung out with the people that the regular people said he shouldn't be hanging out with. I think he was pretty, uh, uh, wasn't discriminating at all when he, when he came. But if, if you can sort of ignore that, and you can sort of tow this line, and you, can con and you can gut legislation, and prevent legislation, and stop things from people, you know, being able to have inheritance rights in marriage. You know, if your partner dies, and you've been together for 40 years, and you know you're stuck with a 15% inheritance tax immediately, and you know the IRS doesn't wait for some mourning period. Immediately, that's wrong. That is absolutely wrong. So the things you're espousing, the things you are doing, the things that you do every day, cause you to have blood on your hands. This causes people to be miserable and take their lives. And, and that's what's hard for me. I, I cannot, I cannot fathom that. Uh, uh, and, I, and, and that is deeply hurtful to me as a person who was brought up in that world 
to see that happening. In the same week, the absolute same week, that uh, the Philadelphia Archdiocese closed two Catholic schools, two Catholic schools, they sent $50,000 to the effort in Maine to stop marriage equality. $50,000, that's probably two teachers. That's probably two teachers. But they actually could somehow find 50 grand to send. Astonishing. And every diocese in Pennsylvania donated some level. It wasn't 50, it was 1,000 was here. But every one of them, and, you, and there's no way in God's green earth that you can't tell me that that, was, that came right out of the collection plate. So that's, I mean, that's, I mean, I, I'm sorry to get so emotional, no, no, but it is, no, it is, no, no. It is it's just an, it, it angers me to no end. It really does. And that's, and so it makes my spiritual life very difficult. Like I said, no problem with the boss, it's the employees. So in the past, then, you've been very much involved, you're very aware and very involved, maybe even not professionally, but as a sidelight in uh, civil rights efforts. Yeah. I mean, I mean, three, so for, I've been doing this for three years. But like I said, I was the, you know, I was the board chair of Common Roads. That's the youth group. I was the board chair of the community center. I was the board chair that combined, you know, that merged the organizations. You know, I did that for a long time. You know, I remember Common Roads. You know, years ago, when this was still somewhat common, when parents would throw their kids out. You know, the executive director would call me and she said, like, Can you, you know, this kid needs three hundred bucks. This kid needs a thousand bucks. And I would like raise, I go quietly. And like, and I have to like, you know, my friends would see me coming, they'd like scatter because I, you know, they knew I was coming, you know, for money. I was going to come for us. I mean, there was. I remember the one kid got uh, got a, was going to get a vic or didn't have rent money, and um, you know, so uh, I went. Uh, it was Christmas Eve. I'll never forget. There, Christmas Eve it was a week before Christmas. I went to a bar and I had to get up in the middle of a drag show, which is <laughs> always astonishing, and, and, and with a Santa Claus hat and pass a Santa Claus hat to get money, you know, and I did that, you know. So, you know, those kind of things, you know, were always issues that I, I was going to talk about. Uh, and so I've always been, I've never been shy about talking about politics. So, you know, those type of civil rights, uh, you know, even before the gay stuff um, in my life, I've always And now been, that's your job. It's my job. It is really my job. I feel very... Does that make you happy? It does. I feel remarkably lucky, remarkably lucky to be here. I think that um, for all of the the hard hours um, and the constant um, grind of this job. I mean, it's never far from me. It is never, ever far from me. Um, the constant asking, the constant um, pushing, the constant dragging, the frustrations. Um, I love every minute of this. I mean, I really feel almost that this is kind of what I was meant to do in many ways. So I feel incredibly lucky that I found this niche. Um, I really found this um, incredible niche. And I also have to say I have a remarkably supportive husband who helps me in so many ways to do this, so many ways to, to really go through this. Um, uh, but you know this is this is this is glorious. It just it really is. I mean this is real change. This is real change. Um, again we might be a little redundant here but probably not. Um... I'm sure I have a story to fill it. <laughs> uh, are there events in your life that you would cite as critical events? Yeah, I mean, I think, I always think of my world as um, like pre-coming out and post-coming out. Mm -hmm. I mean, I really think that that was such a, such a, I mean, that changed my whole world. I mean, it really did. So it was a turning point of some sort. Yeah, it was a huge turning point. It's, you know, I think coming back to central Pennsylvania was probably another huge turning point. In what way? Well, you know, uh, I grew up in western Pennsylvania. My family was not poor, but we weren't rich. Um, you know, I mean, you know what my parents did. And, you know, my parents, one of the first things they told me was to get out of Pennsylvania. I mean, one of the first things they told me was to, you know, go somewhere else. And that had impact. I mean, so I went somewhere else. And I never, ever thought in my life I'd be back here. I really never, ever thought I'd be back here. I loved Carlisle as a student. I mean, it was a wonderful place to live. And so, I mean, I think the fact that I'm here now at 48, 
is probably pretty, some grand irony because I never really wanted to be here. And the fact that I'm trying to change the place or working to change the place, uh, also a huge grand irony, I think, in my life. Um, so those are, those are turning points. Those are absolute turning points in my mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. um, what are the greatest changes you've seen in your lifetime? You know, the greatest changes, I think, um, in the world, I mean, I have to say the changes that are going on right now with, with LGBT issues are pretty remarkable. They really are remarkable. I mean, I think, I think the, I like to say, so I, I go to these meetings, you know, I'm, I'm always in meetings. So, you know, I mean, meetings with, like, you know, legislators who, you know, want to understand, I mean, the, 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 the pro people, the supportive people, they want to understand gay people, they want to understand the gays, and they want to get the gays, and, and like, I make cracks all the time, like, I, I, I my, you know, I'm, uh, one of my probably biggest strong points is I don't take anything too seriously, and it's probably one of my, gets me in a lot of trouble, too, so, like, I make cracks all the time, so I say, like, you know, in these meetings, like, well, you know, gays are the new black, everyone wants one, you know, in these meetings where politicians are trying to figure out, like, how to get their votes and their money, you know, and all these sort of, like, you know, and it's just so, it's just so funny, so I think the fact that I'm having conversations, I mean, I remember, you know, talking to, you know, so back to, back to the governor, I, I think, uh, I remember when he was sitting next to me um, at FAB, and my husband was sitting next to me, and Dwayne doesn't like chocolate. It kind of it bothers him sometimes. With uh, you know, much to my, you know, much I mean, good for me. So I was talking. I was in a big serious conversation with Governor Rendell and uh, or then Mayor Rendell, and and Dwayne was sort of shoving his chocolate dessert on my plate. And um, you know, Ed Rendell was had one eye on me and one eye on the food because if you knew a Governor Rendell, he loved his food. So you know, loves his food. So and so he said to me uh, in the conversation, he said. He's feeding you, Ted. And I said, that's why I love him, Ed. And at that point, I was just like, <laughs> I was like, wow. You know, like, I, this guy's going to be the governor. And I just was that direct. And I think that was another turning point for me. I remember that being so clear. And so, you know, when I use the term husband with legislators who still sometimes are uncomfortable, I love it. I mean, I really, really love it. It's a good, it's a good feeling. So I always say, like, I use the term husband with people I like and don't like. So, you know, it's, it's a real, you know, black and white thing. But, you know, that was a turning point, too. I mean, I think that was absolutely, certainly a point. Um, the, the greatest changes, uh, I go back to that. Do you see changes in the situation? Yeah, and I, I think I got off track a little bit on your question. But, mm -hmm. you know, I think... It was a good... Oh. But I think I think there are people struggling to understand these things of varying degrees. I think a lot of people have just said, like, the vast majority of people have said, you know what? <laughs> because they, they know they know out people, they know LGBT people, and they're like, you know what? Like the foundations of society haven't collapsed. So, you know, like let's just have lunch. You know, it's like let's just move on. You know, and and I think I think that's a, that's a remarkable change because people. When they know your, you know, they know you as your, the, your coworker, your neighbor, the person that picks up your mail when you're not home, uh, you know, or on vacation, like that kind of stuff. It just changes the world, and that's a remarkable change. That's an incredible change. So, so when I see that, is, I think is incredible. When I see conversations, I think you know that I have with legislators is incredible. When I see young people, when I see like high school people, you know, like fighting to have a GSA. You know, I can tell you, like high school is is the worst for 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 LGBT kids. That's like the jungle. I mean, if you get out of high school, you're lucky. Then your world's good. Then it's all better, as they say, for the most part. So these, you know, these kids, 17, and I never had the guts to do this, um, standing up for themselves in places that are rural, in places that may not be the most advanced in the world, but standing up and fighting. That's a change. That's a remarkable change. And those kids are going to run the world. And that's incredible. Um, I'll ask you about artifacts and so forth after this. But uh, do you, uh, have we missed something that you would like to talk about? No, I think that, you know, I, I, think, I think we are winning. I, I, just, I, I just really, I want people not to be discouraged. I want people to sort of keep fighting. And I think... You know, what I say to gay people all the time, what I say to audiences all the time, and I mean LGBT people, and I, I mean this, you know, but, you know, being, being LGBT, 
unfortunately comes with a special little level of recognition. We're almost there, but you got to keep fighting. You just got to keep fighting. And you have to realize that people are going to ask you questions that they would never ask anyone else. But you can't always be insulted. What kind of questions? Yeah. I mean, all those sexual questions. I mean, all of those sort of goofy, you know, like stereotypic questions about, you know, like, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, lesbians in their trucks and gay men in their designs and all, you know, like that kind of stuff. I think you just have to realize that that's a sign of progress because most of the time, you know, I, I always said, like, I speak to a lot of audiences. I've never had a question thrown at me in malice. I can say that honestly. I've had a lot of goofy questions, but goofy questions are good. So when you're, I, I, I have to say, when you're, so for the LGBT community, don't always be offended by those things. We're almost there. You just got to hang on. You just got to keep pushing. And, and I think in 10 years, the world is going to be remarkably different. I mean, my goal is just really to kind of work myself out of a job. <laughs> so, you know, and, but I think that's going to happen. I really do think that's going to happen. Um, you were going to tell us about going to the White House. Well, this has to be, I'd say well, maybe a, it wasn't the White House. It's the White House. Washington. Yeah, it was a big, so, so uh, Dwayne and I, I, I got invited to a holiday event at the White House. And it was a holiday party at the White House. And so, um, you know, Dwayne and I went down and, uh, you know, we, we went in and I remember walking towards the White House and I said to him, I said, you know, if this is only a tour. Uh, you know, I said, this is going to be a pain because you know, like, I have to carry my coat around. And Dwayne just like rolled his eyes. So we get in line. There's a very small group of people. And uh, they usher us in to the White House, and, you know, in the east wing of the White House. And you come in. And, and so we're met immediately by two beautiful Marines. And they bring out the best looking Marines ever in the White House for, for these parties. And the when I guy said, like, welcome to the White House. The coat check's right ahead of you on the right. And I said to Dwayne, I said, this is the real fucking thing. There's a coat check. And so we walked forward, and we checked our coats. And so we walked a little bit further uh, in the, into the building. And uh, some, some two more guards, Marine guards, and they said, um, uh, can you please, um, you know, here's your ticket for the photo line. I said, oh, thank you. And I put this ticket in my pocket, didn't think anything of it. They said, please enjoy the, the buildings open for your pleasure. Just enjoy yourself. So we sort of walked around and then we kind of walked a little bit further and the, the, uh, the hallway, the, I don't know what the ground floor hallway was divided in half. It was a really elaborate d division. So we went into the one, like the China room and there was a library and we walked around and everything's open so you can go in and they're butlering food and all this was pretty fantastic. And so you know, we're in the White House and so uh, we came out and there was this line forming and I said, what is this? And they said, oh, this is the line for the photos. You might want to get in line. So what's, what's the ticket on your photo? What time is it on, on your photo? And I'm like, I don't know, and I pulled out and said 6.30, and I said, oh, you should get in line. So we got in line. Dwayne and I were standing there, we were talking to these folks in front of us, and it turned out the guy in front of us was the former uh, uh, chairman of HBO, and the guy behind me was the former chairman of the National Endowment for the Humanities. So we're, we're, thinking, we're thinking, this is okay. So Dwayne and I were sort of chatting, and then they sort of said, please come this way and find your name on the table inside this gate. So we go through this big um, partition, and we walk around, and there's this huge table, and, and so you find your name and you, it's spelled correctly and then you hand it to them with your ticket. So then we said, please, please get in line. So we went around this line and so the, the, we pass, it's the diplomatic reception room, it's the oval room you see when the president comes in and he brings like, you know, prime ministers and all those sort of folks. And there was this other room next to it. So we're getting in line and the line is uh, in front of us and then it turns sharply into the room. Uh, and then the oval room's in front of us. And this so, is the photograph line. Correct. And, okay. and they're butlering food and everything. And we were just chatting with these people, and it was all great. Well, then over to my left, there was a there was sort of like the hall. There was an, uh, uh, an entrance, and there was an elevator right there, and there was a hallway. And I wasn't thinking anything of it, and we're all sort of talking and laughing, and it was all really lovely. And all of a sudden, the elevator opened, um, and Secret Service appeared everywhere and the president stepped off the elevator with the first lady and he was putting his jacket on. I remember he was sort of putting his jacket on and he stepped back for her and I said to Dwayne, I was like, oh my God, turn around. And so we turned around and there's like the president and he's like, hello everybody, how are you? And she waved and he put his jacket on and then they walked by us and I'm like, oh my God, this is real. We're going to have our photo taken with the president. This is like the real thing. This is like real. So he's like, I know. So, so we get in and the line starts moving and then you, so the, so you enter the, the, the room and you're met by a Marine guard. And the Marine Guard is there kind of to educate you, essentially. And so they're like, uh, 
you're Mr. Ted Martin from Camp Hill. This is Mr. Dwayne Hecker from Camp Hill. You live at six four you know, blah blah blah. You're you know, and you'll be here for the photo of the white knight. And you're like, yes, yes. So you're sort of moving around the room and there's they're your escort and they're talking to you. So you get to the other side and they take and they, they take anything like uh, uh, purses or envelopes, anything you're carrying. So then you go to the another entrance. Uh, and another Marine guard meets you, and this is your escort to the president's. And I remember this guy was just gorgeous. He was this beautiful Marine with this little tiny waist and dress uniform, just, just really handsome. And he said, "I'll be your Mar I'll be your uh, escort to meet the president. Please follow me." And he so he said, "You're, you're Mr. Mr. Ted Martin. You're Mr. Dwayne Hecker. Um, please understand that you're going to have your photo taken with the president. Uh, uh, Mr. Martin, the first lady, will be on your right. Mr. Hecker, the president, will be on your left. Please greet them promptly. Uh, you'll have two minutes with them. Please turn promptly for a two-minute photo. You'll hear two clicks. Share niceties and please move on. And so they're giving you stage direction while you're moving around the edge of the room. So before I knew it, literally two feet in front of us was the president, the first lady, me greeting these, the people in front of us, the HBO guy and his sister, it turned out. So it's like amazing. It's just this amazing thing. And so I turned to the I, I turned to the Marine and he said, uh, he looked at me and he looked at Dwayne and he said, husband or partner? And I said, husband. And I just I looked and I said, husband. And he immediately turned and he said, uh, Mrs. Obama, I said, President Obama and President and Mrs. Obama, allow me to introduce Mr. Ted Martin and his husband, Mr. Dwayne Heckert of Pennsylvania. And I met the president, and you know he's very tall. Or they're both very tall, and you know we talked, and we had the photo taken, and you know it's, they're very lovely people. You know you're with them for literally two minutes, uh, and then they kind of usher you off. And I remember Mrs. Obama's next to me, and she's very tall, and she looked down at me, and she said, "Now have a good time." And all I could utter was, "Yes, ma'am." That's all I could utter. And she's like my age, you know, and I it's just like I just didn't know what else to say. And so they usher you in this room to pick up your things, and Dwayne and I started to cry. I mean, because you know, yeah, we just met the president, but. We had just been introduced as husbands to the President of the United States, to the President of the United States. And it was at that point I said to myself, you know, if I can say husband to the President of the United States, damn it, I can say it to anybody. You know, I am saying it to anybody. And so at that point, it was just like such a moment, you know, and literally we were with him and the, the first like four minutes. But it was just, just like glorious. I mean, it was just so amazing. And I think, you know, and, and now that's an incredibly special moment for Dwayne and I. But people need to understand that, you know, this is, this is part of the shift. I mean, the world is shifting. You know, for that Marine to know that. And so, you know, later on in the evening, you know, I, so I said to Dwayne, I said, oh, there's the Marine. And Dwayne said, yeah. And I said, uh, well, I said I wanted him for Christmas, but you know, Dwayne kind of ignored that. But uh, I said, I want to talk to him. And Dwayne's like, well, go, go ahead. So I went over and I said to him, I said, excuse me. And he, you know, very polite and incredibly diplomatic. And I leaned down, he leaned down and I said, you know, you introduced, you escorted us to meet the president and the first lady. And he said, yes. And I said, I, I just wanted to thank you. And he said, for what? And I said, and he gave me, he said, and I said, you know, you were really kind enough to, inter to give me the option. Of, of introducing, you know, uh, Dwayne as my husband or partner, and I really want to thank you for that. That meant an awful lot. And I, my voice broke. Like it's, I'm getting a little tear right now. And he said, <laughs> he leaned down and he said, "We're not all that bad." And I thought that was the most. And he said, "Now please enjoy the evening." And it was just like the most remarkable, once again. And I think Dwayne and I like floated out of the building. I mean, we were just like left thinking, "My God, you know, that this is just so such a such a." point um, in time and that was that was another thing I think that has to be you know really remarkable and here I was you know the professional homosexual that's why I was invited uh, you know because of the organization I uh, you know I'm the executive director for and uh, you know it was just something you know it was just really really something and then there were my other colleagues were there from other states that I got to see and like we were there you know we're sitting under this White House Christmas tree like having cocktails I mean it was it was remarkable it was really a really a Incredible moment. Well, it's true. Straight people don't understand how big that is. Well, exactly. I mean, I think you know, uh, what twenty years, less than twenty years ago, there was no Pride Festival. What less than you know, eight years ago, there was no Pride celebration in the White House, and you know, there was plenty of gay people around. Believe me, but you know, it wasn't anything that was recognized or understood, or you certainly didn't have the president. Not batting an eye, being introduced to two men as husbands, uh, and you know, or the first lady sort of being gracious and warm and fun, and you know, I mean, it just, I think that's such a remarkable thing. I mean, I think that's just such a remarkable change, um, and that's that's a moment I'll never forget, never, ever, ever forget. I guess not. So.
something. Do you have any more like that? Not quite like that, huh? No, not quite like that. I think that was a big one. I think that's a hard one to top. I mean, I really think that's a hard one to top. But, yeah, I mean, I, like I said, I just feel really honored to be doing this. I really feel honored to be doing this. I think I am lucky in so many ways in my life. Um, I think I was lucky to land this job when I did. I mean, I think there are so many people that worked so much harder than I have. I mean, I think so, so many people who suffered, uh, you know, in these similar positions and really, you know, I've never faced physical violence or, you know, the hoses at a riot or any of that kind of stuff. Those people really... Have you, have you experienced homophobia uh, apart from what you were sort of reading at uh, Dickinson, a kind of reticence? You know, I just, I just, maybe I'm just innocent enough to not pay attention. I mean, you know, I'm sure it's there, you know, I'm sure there are people, and I know that, I, I mean, I know that when I talk about these issues, I know people are uncomfortable sometimes. You know, I need people kind of, you know, when you talk about the gay stuff, they, you can see, you know, through body language. Um, but I don't know. I mean, I'm not out there looking for it, you know. I, I have to feel that every step forward is progress, and I just don't. I don't know. I'm sure I, yeah, it's out there. Trust me, it's out there. But you know, if I had to, I think if I had to worry about that, I'd never get out of bed. I mean, you. I mean, I'd have, like. If I didn't think things were going to change, I'd have like jumped off a bridge a long time ago. Mm -hmm. I mean, I could never do this work. Mm -hmm. You know, I could just never do this work.